I think the benefit of going last is you'll probably appreciate if I'm relatively brief. Uh, and I won't go into the science. I am not an expert. Uh, before I actually talk more about what you'd most like to hear, which are divestment, I think it would be helpful to understand a, a few aspects of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, including exactly who we are. We are not the Rockefeller Foundation. They are our larger uh, cousin. They have more dollar assets than we. Uh, we are the second largest of many philanthropic institutions that the Rockefeller family founded. Many of them have the Rockefeller name, but many of them don't. So there are some that you wouldn't even be aware of. Um, one of the intangible assets, yet that is so critical to us, are that half of our board continue to be family members. And we are so fortunate to have those individuals who are so deeply concerned about the world and the issues challenging it, including, of course, climate change. The family has been interested and supportive of the environment for decades. Uh, they were so instrumental in preserving green space across the country, both here in the United States and actually also outside of the United States. So the whole concept of the environment and climate change, although the climate change wording is new, the caring for the environment certainly isn't. Stephen Rockefeller, who is one of our more elder members that are now on the board still, he was one of the co-authors of the Earth's Charter. So this is something that has been near to and dear to the family for years. We have had uh, what's called a sustainable development program area, and it's one of our key program areas for many, many years. Uh, from prior to climate change, it was focusing on sustainable fisheries, water pollution, the British rainforest, and I'd say the last 15 years, really, that it has been the primary fo focus of that program on battling climate change. And our program director in that group, Michael Northrup, is, is really one of the smartest people in this space and has worked so hard. Um, I want to certainly thank 350.org for today. We were one of the founders of it, Michael and, and one of his colleagues, and we're so proud of the incredible influence they have had. I also want to thank a group that I don't think anyone is here from, although I'm in, involved with them, Divest Invest Philanthropy. Without them, many of the foundations, including the RBF, would not have made the announcement last year. Ellen Dorsey, uh, who's actually the CEO in her day job of the Global, I'm sorry, of the Wallace Global Fund, was tireless in coming to see us and very patient in explaining to us and allowing us the time to really think about the issue because it's not one you take lightly, whether or not you divest um, your portfolio of fossil fuels. Obviously, we came to the conclusion that we did. The other factor before I go into the divestment story is just to let you know a little bit of, of terminology and um, how we manage our investments. Um, I am the VP for Finance and Operations, but I'm not an investment professional. I understand them, I can report on them, I can account for them, but I cannot be the one that's setting up the asset portfolio. So we have what's called an outsourced chief investment office structure. That's something that is probably within the last almost 10 years become more common for universities and endowments that aren't of the mega size because we cannot afford to really develop the depth uh, and expertise of an investment internal department, an internal investment department, to encompass all the complexities of, of global investing. So that phraseology, OCIO, Outsource Chief, Chief Investment Office, will start to run through the story that I'll tell. Um, again, the family has been involved in the environment for years and so keen on using its philanthropic dollars to support issues that are key uh, to the, the safety and sustainability and peaceful state of the world. Um, so really it was in the early 2000s then that a new filter and, and look came about was we have, if you know anything about foundation law, foundations must spend 5% of their endowment on grant making, which means the other 95% does not have to be spent year to year. Now many foundations, including ourselves, we are supposed to protect the environment so that we can be in existence forever, so that future generations of the Rockefeller family and whoever else is on the board and the team can address future issues. But in the meantime, they decided or started to think about what power of that 95% can we use to further support our program areas. 
And in the mid-2000s, it was felt at that time, before we were in this OCIO model, where we directly managed our investments ourselves and therefore had direct ownership, that power was best served by proxy voting guidelines and the shareholder engagement that you've heard people talk about. And we developed very complex 32 pages of guidelines that we engaged risk metrics, um, and which Brad worked at, at the time, I, I guess, um, to exercise that right for us and to report to us. And we did that for three proxy seasons because we covered everything, environment, social, governance, just really good practices for companies. And we sought to influence companies, as you heard tonight. In 2007, the, the end of that, we entered into what's called an OCIO model, where all of our investments were commingled with 13 other clients. So we lost the right to own anything directly or to really influence. So we started to have conversations with the board um, and with our OCIO at the time. How can we now, since we've lost the proxy voting rights, what can we do now to again draw some of the power of the 95% of our assets to influence the areas that we thought were important. And the board decided the best way to do that with, with the support of staff of, um, was to devote 10% of our portfolio, so at the time in 2010 it was about $70 million, to proactive investing that would, we'd find investments with our OCIO that would directly support the program areas that we work on, which are primarily uh, sustainable development slash climate change Peace building, right now we're working primarily in the Middle East, and democratic practice, which the key focus in the US is campaign finance reform. We don't work on anything easy. Um, but we decided that we would take that 10% and try and proactively invest in dollars that would, although they weren't grants, they would support the same kinds of issues that the grant making folks were doing. And we were able to achieve a little bit of progress with that, but we realized that, more than you need to know, but just part of the story, the OCIO that we had, fantastic organization, but as I said, our monies were commingled. So we really didn't have much influence to exactly what would be invested and what wouldn't, and how much expertise they would develop in sustainable investing slash impact investing. So at that point in time, it was really decided that we had to start thinking about how to best in, uh, invest the 10%, but at the same time, like all of us, we're always thinking of, well, do we need to go deeper? And is it problematic that if sustainable development gets directly one third of our grant making budget, but then our other program areas often do cross collaborative work with them, so 50% of our grant making budget is going to climate change work Yet we now know that in our investment portfolio, there's a lot of money that's directly undermining every grant dollar we make. So why, in a way, write a grant? Because we, our investments are in undermining it. So that whole um, thought process began, and it created the need to, one, change our OCIO to one where we could have a more customized portfolio, but also then start a process that we never take anything lightly, we do everything carefully because we're long-term investors, we take our fiduciary responsibility very seriously, and we went through all the scenarios that people have alluded to. Well, if we should divest, what does that mean? What, how can we possibly do it? How long would it take to do it? And what would it mean to the portfolio now and, and maybe in the future? And we didn't want to do it in a grandstanding way unless we had been very thoughtful and had a lot of the facts behind us. We find that sometimes you'll hear of institutions making a statement and then two or three years later you might realize that it wasn't so meaningful and, and that's actually more damaging than not making a statement. So we wanted to take our own approach and as I said, Ellen Dorsey and Divest Invest was extremely patient with us. But last June, and just to understand the pressure our new OCIO was under, we hired them in March of 2014. In June of 2014, so just three months later, I had to call them up and say, there's something happening in September of last year, climate change week. We want to know whether or not we can announce that we can divest from fossil fuel. So you need to really get a lot of work done and let us know, one, what do we have? And two, how could we possibly tackle this? So again, much discussion. We decided to initially focus in our announcement, as you heard us say back then, 
on coal and tar sands. Those are the two areas of fossil fuel we found most egregious to the whole issue of climate change. But we pledged then that we would commit to considering where, how we could con then expand that divestment from the rest of fossil fuels. But of course, and it was, a, it was stated tonight, the first step is know what you own. You, so you have to do that analysis and figure out how much fossil fuel exposure do you have now. So last June, when we, in July and August, when we were working hard with our uh, investment manager on this, we realized that total fossil fuel exposure, and when we talk about exposure, again, all transparency and to make sure people know what we're saying, we're talking about the producers. We have not yet put the lens on the energy users, the airlines, etc. So we're talking about fossil fuel producers. We found um, last August that we had about 6.6% of the portfolio in total fossil fuels and just under 1% in coal and tar sands. We knew also that most of that exposure came from old legacy investments before this OCIO structure. The, they were primarily private equity that we couldn't, they were illiquid, we couldn't get out of them then or we, even now unless we wanted to take a bath in selling them. We do have that other mandate of also preserving the portfolio. We thought, all right, what's the path? Can we naturally continue to reduce those while we take some other steps to continue to reduce the total exposure? Um, by the time Stephen Heinz, our president, announced last September that we were going to make the pledge to divest, we were um, as a, down to 5.2% in total fossil fuels and 0.8% in coal and tar sands. I'm pleased to say we are now at 4.5% in total fossil fuels and less than half a percent in coal and tar sands. So again, while preserving the portfolio, because that is important, and for several reasons, two primary are one that I've said, which is perpetuity for the foundation, but also if we feel, which is the same as if you asked us about our impact investing, we're not doing below market concessionary impact investing, we're doing market-like returns impact investing for the same reason that we said we will do our divestment gradually and smartly because we feel we can influence others more to, to follow us and to do the, to come on this path if we can show them you can do it well and as others here said, you can do it well and not harm your portfolio. So that's the task that we have. It's not an easy one, um, but we are finding good progress and we're making good progress, both in reducing the fossil fuel exposure, expanding our influence, including with the asset managers. Part of the challenge that we were told would happen, and we did see it, are many of the top quality asset managers don't want to he hear constraints from their clients. They want to be told that you have full discretion and go out and earn as much money as you can. We had to recalibrate our own investment committee as we went along in the discussion. We realized that besides all the really smart investors that we had on, on the committee, we also needed some of those same intelligent types from the Wall Street firms that had seen the light. They understood the importance of climate change. Once we had them at the table with everyone else and with our investment manager, we could really have good conversations and rebut the arguments that would be given to us. So with the asset managers, what we've learned is, yes, there are some who still won't customize funds for us yet, because when we tell them we'd rather not have these assets in the portfolio, um, but there have been some successes. One that first told us no, two days after Stephen Heinz announced our divestment, actually called up our investment manager and said, you know what, we will create a fund with everything that you wanted in it, except we'll exclude the fossil fuel component. We've had another same success story with another manager who has offered to do that for us. Farallon, which is a huge hedge fund, uh, Tom Starr had formed it many years ago, he then left, he's very active in this field, but he still knows many of the people. They've recently created a fossil fuel free fund even more Fs because you have to add on the Farallon. We've invested in that. So there's progress. The, the device, Divest Invest Group is at the time of the, when it, say, about this time last summer, it had 17 signatories. It's now up to 105. So the, where the goal is by Paris, we hope to have 200. 
We also hope that the Rockefeller Brothers Fund is no longer the largest foundation that has signed on. We still are trying to encourage our very large uh, peers to come along with us, um, but we're doing this carefully, and I thank you all. The work of 350.org and even the March last year and everything has really shown the world how important this is and how it's important across all generations, all classes, all countries. This is the issue that we all have to face and, and deal with. So.